Okay, so now that you know the definition of what a function and what a relation is, let's look at a couple more definitions that you're going to learn. First, domain, and then range. They're pretty easy. Domain is just defined as the set of values of the independent variable, or normally we just think of it as what are the possible x values that exist on this function. The range is just the opposite. What are the set of values of the dependent variable, or what we normally think of as the y values? what possible y values exist. We sort of form these as a list. So we would want to write down, okay, so if I know that the values of 1, 2, and 3 exist for x values, I would make them a list. And in math, we write lists in brackets that look like these. These are curly looking brackets, but they have a name. They're called set brackets. The reason they're called set brackets is because we use them when we want to create sets of numbers or lists. It sort of means the same thing in math. So these are set brackets. Of course, I, when I'm class and when I'm teaching, I normally just call them squiggly brackets because that's what they look like. It also takes some time to get to get to learn how to draw them properly. A lot of times you'll see people and they kind of stro struggle drawing these set, set brackets. And sometimes you just see little squiggles like this. It doesn't matter to me, as long as I know that it's different than these rounded ones. Okay, so let's remember. Domain is just whatever possible x values exist, and range is just whatever possible y values exist. So let's see if we can use these. So here's some examples. For each of these, can we find the domain and range? So here's the first one. We just have a set of four ordered pairs. The ordered pairs are 1, 2, 4, 5, 3, 6, and 2, 5. So let's start with domain. Remember, domain is just the set or a list of any possible x values that exist. How we write it is we put capital D, it stands for domain, and then we put a little colon. This just means that we're defining the domain as this list that I'm going to write in set brackets. So I open up the set brackets like so. Now I just look at my points and I say, okay, what are my x values that exist? Well, I have the 1, I have a 4, I have a 3, and I have a 2. So I'm just going to list them. 1, 4, 3, and 2. And I close the bracket. See? Hard to draw a curly bracket, but you know what I mean. Notice how the order is not numerical order. It's not going from lowest to highest. It doesn't matter. All I care about is it's a list. These are the possible values of x. That's my domain. All right, what about the values for y? Or the range? Again, range, we just use a capital R, put a colon because we're defining the range, and then start the list by putting a set bracket. The possible y values here are 2, 5, 6, and then we have another 5. So I'm going to write 2, 6, 5, but because 5 is listed twice, I don't need to say that my range is 5 and then another 5. 5 is already there. So in this case, there's only three possible values that y could be, 2, 6, or 5. I didn't even write them in the order that they were listed here. I should have maybe put 2, 5, 6, but again, it doesn't matter. As long as they're listed there, the answer is going to be right. So just looking at this, notice how there's four values for the domain and only three for the range. That's okay. Maybe there's only going to be 10 values for the domain and only one value for the range. That could be possible too. They don't have to be the same number. As long as every number is represented in the list, that's all that matters. Okay, what happens if I have an example where I don't even have a list, I have a graph? Well, things get a little bit more interesting when we deal with graphs instead of, you know, sets of ordered pairs or tables of values. If you look at this, ask yourself, what possible values of x is, exist for this line? And don't forget that this line goes on forever, forever in both directions. Well, what do we see on this graph? We see that we have the point 8 here uh, on the x-axis, and we have a point 5 here on the y-axis. 
But does that really affect what the x values are? I mean, the x value can exist here at 8, but here an x value is 0. Anywhere in between, this could be the x value of 4, and maybe over here is an x value of 6, but because this line goes through all those points between 8 and 5, or sorry, between when x is 8 and when x is 0, pretty much x can be anything in between there. It could be 1, it could be 2, it could be 3, it could be 3.5, it could be 3.7, it could be 3.8888887442. All of those could exist for x. It would take a long time to list all of those things. So there are other ways to do it. But are there x values that exist beyond 8 and 0? Well, of course. This line goes on forever. And in fact, if you continue this line forever, you would hit every possible x value that could exist beyond the number 8. It would go up to infinity. And same thing on this side. If we extended this line out forever, eventually you would hit every single x value that goes into the negatives. So it would go to negative infinity. Well, how on earth do I list all of those numbers in my domain? Well, luckily mathematicians are kind of lazy sometimes, and they make shortcuts for everything. So if I want to write down that x is any possible number that exists, we write it like this. I still start with domain being capital D, and then I put a colon to say that I'm defining the domain, and I start my set brackets. And now I say this. I say x, and I draw this little E-shaped thing. It's like a curvy E. It's like a capital E but curved. And then I draw this double barred R and then I end my set brackets. Hmm, x, weird E-shaped e thing, double barred r. What on earth are you talking about? Well, what we're doing is we're actually using some Latin in here, and we're using some math symbols. We know what x means. This little e here, this is called an epsilon. And what it means to us is, um, it means that x is an element of, so we read this as x is an element of or basically what that means is all the values of x are and then we have this double barred r. If you can remember back to, uh, I don't know, grade 7, grade 8, or maybe even before then, you learned about different number systems. One of them was the real number system one of them was the integer system, one of them was whole number system, one of them was the natural number system. You know, all of those are different number systems. The real number system is all the numbers that we know that exist between negative infinity and positive infinity. So in math, if we want to say that all possible values of x exist in the real number system, we just use this capital letter R, but with two bars. It's written in what we call script. And there you have it. This to me, when you write x, e, r, just like this, tells me that x is, is any number in the real number system. All right, what about our range? How about y? Well, notice how this line goes on forever downwards and also goes on forever upwards. So any possible y value would exist for this line too. So my range for this question, I start with capital R and I define it and put it in set brackets, is that all values of y are elements of the real number system. Any possible value between negative infinity and infinity exists for y. And there you have it. My domain is xer, and my range is yer. Okay, let's look at this parabola. This parabola is facing downwards, and we see that it has a vertex at this point right here. The point is negative 4, negative 2. So let's again start with our domain. What are the possible values that x could be on this parabola? Well, I know that x goes along the horizontal, so if I start at the vertex, and I know that this parabola goes on forever, downwards, and always goes outwards as well. It never comes back in on itself. So even though it's you know slightly sloping towards going straight down, eventually this will hit every possible x value that exists beyond going to the right. And this little curve here eventually will hit every single x value that goes beyond to the left. 
it may take a very long time, but it will happen. So again, x could be any possible value in between negative infinity and infinity. So this is an easy one, x, e, r. Okay, is the range the same? Can any possible value of y exist on this function? Well, let's see. I know that this goes on forever downwards, so it'll eventually hit every single y value all the way down to negative infinity. But is there a limit to how high it can go? Well, of course there is. Right at the vertex right here is its maximum point. y can't be any higher than negative 2. Well, so how do I write that? I want to write that y has to be equal to negative 2 or anything less than negative 2. It can't be anything greater than negative 2. Well, this is how we write it. I still start with my set bracket. I still say that y are all the values of y are elements of the real number system. This is still true because y could be any whole number, could be any decimal, could be any fraction, could be anything. But there is a restriction. We are saying that y has to be equal to or less than negative 2. So when I write a restriction, I put a little slash here, a forward slash, and I say, okay, y has to be any, any number in the real number system, but, this slash means but, y has to be less than or equal to negative 2. And I end my little curly brackets. That was a terrible curly bracket, but I end my curly brackets like that. So let's read this again. All the values of y are in the real number system, but all the values of y have to be less than or equal to negative 2. If you get your less than and greater than symbols mixed up, don't forget that the sign is always trying to eat the thing that's greater. So you can draw little teeth here if you want. Okay, this thing's trying to chomp down on the thing that's greater. So because y is less than negative 2, negative 2 is the greater thing here. So the sign's trying to eat the negative 2. That's how you can always tell which is less. I mean, another way you can do it is it always points to the thing that's less. Just like how, I don't know, maybe if you're in a group of friends and they were pointing at you because they looked down on you, you can think that, oh, well, it's because you're le less than them. But, I mean, that was maybe a poor example. But whatever makes you remember it, that's how you should remember it. So there's the domain and range for this graph right here. Okay, one more. Here we have a circle, and I'll throw the little x and y uh, axes on there. Uh, we aren't given any points in the circle, but we are told that the equation is x squared plus y squared equals 36. Now you got to think all the way back to grade 10 and try to remember, okay, if I know that x squared plus y squared is 36 is my equation of the circle, what does that tell me about the circle? Do you remember? Well, what it tells us is the radius. We know the radius of the circle is the square root of whatever this number is uh, on the other side of the equal sign. So the square root of 36, uh, we know, is 6. So the distance from the center, 0, 0, to any spot on the circle is going to be 6 units. And what that can help us with is that I know that this point right here is going to be the point 6. This point up here is going to be at the point 6. This point over here is going to be at the point negative 6. And this one down here is going to be at the point negative 6. Well, how does that help us with domain and range? Well, let's think about the possible x values that can exist. So my domain. Well, I know that this circle exists for any x values that go as far as 6. And then you can see anything in between 6 all the way to negative 6. Now it can be any fraction, any whole number, any positive, any negative number, as long as it's between 6 and negative 6. So again, we need to write that x, or all the values of x that we want, are going to be elements of the real number system. But our restriction is that x has to fall between anything between 6 and negative 6. So this is how we write it. We start with what the lower bound is going to be, negative 6. That's the smallest that I can get for x. So anything x has to be greater 
or equal to negative 6, we're sort of reading that backwards, x is greater or equal to negative 6, or you could say negative 6 is less than or equal to x. But all the values of x also have to be less than or equal to positive 6. This is my upper bound. And so this encompasses all the possible values for x, anything between negative 6 and 6. Make sure the signs are pointing in the right direction, though. A lot of times I see students write greater than or equal and greater than or equal, or they'll write less than or equal and then over here write greater than or equal. Well, that's not true. x has to be in between negative 6 and 6, so greater or equal to negative 6, but less than or equal to 6. How about the range? Well, the range is very similar to the domain in this case. Notice how the upper bound for the range is at 6, and the lower bound for the range is at negative 6. Well, so that means that all the values of y exist in the real number system, or y e r. And again, the lower bound for y is 6, or sorry, negative 6. And the upper bound for y is positive 6, where all the y's exist between negative 6 and 6. There's your domain and range for the circle. All right, so let's recap what you've learned. You've learned what a relation is and what a function is. A function is just a type of relation where for any given x value, only one possible y value can exist. You've also learned what domain and range are. Domain is just the set of all possible x values, while range is just the set of all possible y values. So let's give you something to think about that I want you to bring with you to class the next time. Here's a relation I'm giving you. I'm not telling you whether or not it's a function or not. You need to figure that out y equals 2 over x minus 3. So the questions I want you to ask yourself are, how do we know if this is a function or not? Can we find the domain in the range? And what would something like this look like if you graphed it? I'll give you a hint. Well, I guess you could go online and try to find somewhere where you could graph it. Or you could do it the old-fashioned way and maybe make a table of values. You're going to see some interesting results, and I'm curious to see what you come up with but we'll save that for class. I hope you enjoyed the lesson, and again, remember, rewind or pause if you miss something, and go back and see it again.